Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Jennifer Myers of Sagevest Wealth Management and I wanna welcome you. Uh, before we kick off, I just wanna to touch on a few administrative items that this presentation is being recorded. Um, it will be available for replay on our website at sagevestwealth.com, uh, perhaps in a day or two. And wanted to welcome individuals throughout the presentation to submit questions that you might have. We'll have Q&A at the end, but feel free to interject during the presentation. The way to do so is by utilizing the Q&A uh, feature on your screen to participate. So I wanted to introduce that both uh, this presentation is being offered by both Stage Vest Wealth Management and Inspiration Careers. Uh, we're happy to have you today to discuss the topic of advancing your career without burnout. I'll just briefly introduce my, our, our firm, Stage Vest Wealth Management. We are a fee-only and fiduciary wealth management firm. Uh, we're located in Northern Virginia and McLean, Virginia, but we work with clients nationwide. Um, in terms of providing wealth management, what that means is we, we act as a comprehensive financial advisor on behalf of clients that we actively manage portfolios on behalf of individuals, but really couple it with comprehensive financial planning so that you have uh, a, so a comprehensive architecture. Uh, we sort of say that we serve as the quarterback for your finances, that we make sure that all of the decisions that you're making in your financial life interconnect so that one decision supports the next and so forth. And we also take a very proactive approach. As part of our firm, we work with clients, but we also have a very dedicated um, mission to offering education to individuals that go beyond the clients that we work with. Uh, and that's part of why we're launching this webinar series. It's a three-part series, and this is the kickoff. Um, we offer, additionally, on the topic of three, we offer three uh, educational resource centers on top of our blog uh, section of our website that talk to three different topics of a retirement resource center and a new accumulating wealth resource center and a kid's financial literacy site, so spanning the full spectrum of life. Um, and we, we recently launched the Accumulating Wealth uh, series and, and resource center on our website, largely because we're frequently asked by individuals of how does one accumulate enough money to, to need to hire a wealth manager? And there's a lot to know that goes well beyond just saving and investing money to make sure that you're making those, the totality of the wise financial decisions that help you in the long run. Um, the, the resource center is largely um, designed for individuals in their 20s to their 50s who are in that accu accumulation phase. Um, it's also a, a, a knowledge site or resource site for parents and grandparents who might want an easy and non-invasive way to talk about topics without having to delve into the details with a family member, but being able to offer a resource on a topic that's relevant. Um, there's a lot involved in, in accumulating wealth, as I said, but one of the key aspects and why we're starting with this part of uh, the webinar series is that advancing your career really is a key, key point to uh, accumulating wealth long term. And with that, I'll turn it over to Prerica. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm so excited to be here with you all today. My name is Prerika Agarwal. And a little bit about me is I just left my 20 plus year career as an executive last year to focus on career coaching and executive leadership. This is something that I'm truly, truly passionate about because I truly believe that you get to design the career of your dreams and have ownership and initiative, and that plays so much into the quality of life that you can have. So this is something that I'm very excited to deliver on and talk to you about today. So in terms of today's workshop, there's really five main areas and five objectives that we'll, we'll cover today. The first one is how to advance your career, and I'll be breaking that down into six different steps. We are also going to talk about how you put yourself first and how do you create that visibility. 
And then we're going to deep dive into burnout, how to avoid it, and then think about what engagement looks like, because high engagement at work is definitely a factor in terms of burnout. And then the last thing we'll talk about is deciding if it's time to leave. So let's jump in and start with our six steps. So step number one. Now, this may seem really, really obvious to you, but I find that if you are a high performing individual, you're highly motivated. And if you're listening and watching this webinar, you probably are. You've got a lot of competing priorities. There are so many different things going on. And so it's very, very important to start with this visioning exercise. And this is something that I used to do with my clients that were Fortune 500 executives is think about what does your life look like a year from now? Not just your career, but what does it look like a year from now? Where are you living? How do you spend your time? What's important to you? And where are you working? So you're gonna do that for one year out. And then you're also gonna think about five years out. And you'll notice that you might have gotten this question before in interviews, right? A lot of times they'll say, where do you see yourself five years from now? So really take the time, define this and write it down. Write down what your vision is one year out, five years out, and put this in a place that you'll see often. Because what happens is this is going to be your North Star. And as you have those different things that are going to be pulling you in different directions, you can come back and really anchor to this vision. The next piece is going to be defining your values. Now, this is going to change depending on what phase of life you're in. But really think about your top five values, right? What is it that is important to you? And that's going to play into your priorities, right? So again, think about what's important to you. Where do you want to be spending your time? And really, who do you want to be? Who do you want to be in your career and your life? What do you want to be known for? Then you're going to define your career strategy. And for each person, that's going to be a little bit different. And again, it's going to vary in terms of where you are in your career and what you're thinking about for your vision, right? And so for some people, a promotion is really what they're going after. They want to make it to the next level of their career within the same company. For some folks, the role and the title is very important. So even if it doesn't come with a salary increase, maybe it's not even a promotion, they want that title, a very specific title, and that's important. Salary, of course, is going to dictate wealth, money, all of those things. And so for some people, making the most money right now is going to be the ultimate thing that's important for them. For a lot of you, especially given what's happened in COVID the last few years, it's going to be work culture. Maybe you've been working long hours, you know, it's now you're coming back into the office and you used to be hybrid or remote, and you really are looking for a culture that's going to support you and that's going to align with your values and your vision. Sometimes it's going to be moving out of your industry. So maybe you've worked in, let's say, financial services, management consulting, healthcare, and now you're thinking about what's next and how do I take my career to the next level, but you don't want to stay where you are. Work-life balance is also very important, especially if you're starting a new family, maybe there are some other things going on and you've realized you don't want to be working those 80-hour weeks, 60-hour weeks, and you want more time to yourself. And then the last thing is maybe you're even thinking about starting your own company. And so you've been in corporate for a while or maybe even a short period of time, but entrepreneurship has been on your mind. And along with your values, your vision, and what you're thinking about for the next five years, I want you to also start thinking about retirement age. So for some of you, it may still feel far off, but it's so important, again, to think about what it is that you want from your life and when do you want to retire and what does retirement look like for you and what's the quality of life you want to be living. 
And of course, we were so happy to have Jennifer as well, because SageVest can definitely help you with prioritizing wealth, what retirement looks like. It's definitely the most common thread of what we work on with clients. <laughs> So from there, you're gonna to go to step two, which is using your network. And I know when I say networking, some of you feel a little bit fearful, maybe you're feeling a little bit awkward because it feels very difficult, right? When we talk about networking. So let's break this down into two really easy steps. So the first step is going to be just identifying who is in your network. All of you know a lot of people and Think about your past colleagues, think about alumni, friends, family, and sometimes it's going to be thinking a few degrees out, right? And so you've got your immediate circle of friends and people that you know in your network, but then they all know all of these different people. And maybe within that extended network, there are people that have the role that you're interested in. Maybe they've gone on to start their own company or do the thing that you want to do, or maybe they've advanced really quickly in their career. And so this is a great way to learn and connect with others, right? The second piece is going to be that actual connection part and how we do that tactically. And so there's so many ways to do it. And I like to define it by high tech and low tech. Right, so high tech is going to be doing things online and using platforms such as Clubhouse or LinkedIn. LinkedIn is an amazing tool because it's a fantastic professional network, right? You've got all of your connections on there. They make it really easy for you to connect with your existing email list. Clubhouse is a great speaking app. And so again, if there's something that you are interested in you want to become, let's say, a paid speaker, or you want to start your own co coaching company, something like what I'm doing, you can get onto Clubhouse, you can hear how other experts have done it, you can join these rooms, and you can also contribute to thought leadership. Now, if we talk about low-tech ways to connect with other people, that would be joining any type of groups. So think about professional organizations, think about networking groups based on interests. So I really like to use something called meetup.com because there is something for everyone. If you wanna be in a book club, if you're interested in wine, if you are looking to join other women who have their own businesses, meetup is a great place to do that. And the last way that you can connect with people very tactically is once you've identified who's in your network, who you want to be talking to, and what your next steps are, is setting up informational interviews, right? And so this is simply just asking somebody in your network or extended network for a coffee chat that could be virtual or it could be um, in person and just saying, hey, do you have 15 minutes or 30 minutes? I want to learn how you did X, Y, and Z right? I found this article that you published and I found it intriguing. And this is something I'm really interested in. Or maybe they're working at a company that you're interested in, but you don't know a lot about that company. So this is going to be a great opportunity for you to hear directly from someone, find out more about the culture, get some of your questions answered informally, and really create an application once you do apply or get referred in that's gonna be very, very strong. So I love using these informational interviews. And just a caveat here is, you know, if you send out, let's say a hundred requests, don't worry if all of them don't get answered, right? People are busy, lots of things are going on. And sometimes it's just a numbers game. So just remember that when you are networking. So the next piece is capitalizing on your strengths. So I would say in general, being a high performer, being highly motivated, and just I think the environment that you're used to is we focus so much on things that you know we're not good at, improving ourselves, taking classes to fill all the gaps because we always want that personal development and we always wanna keep improving. And I think this is a little bit of a different take on that, which is really focusing on your strengths 
and investing in developing the strengths that you already have, right? So step one is figuring out what are those strengths. And there's so many ways to do this. There is a tool called Strengths Finder. It's now been rebranded to be called um, Clifton Strengths, but there's a quick online test that you can take and uncover your top five strengths and really align your goals to that. But you can also think about yourself and what you're inclined to do. What are the things that you like to do? What are the things that people tell you that you're really good at? Right. And so you want to list those down and be very clear about those. The next thing is keeping a list of accomplishments. So we are doing so many things day to day in our careers, in our jobs, in our businesses, that it's hard to keep track. And so you want to make this list. And there's two reasons why I want you to do this. One is that it's a huge confidence booster. It is a huge confidence booster to know in the first quarter of 2023 that you've gone and done all of these beautiful, wonderful things. And then the second reason is that you can share that, especially if you're doing performance reviews and that's common in your workplace. You have something that's comprehensive, ready to go, rather than you sitting down at month six or month 12 of the year and then trying to come up with these things on the spot. Right. So it's going to make your life really easy and it's going to be a really good confidence booster for you to have all of those things. And of course, if you are looking to move into a different company or do something else, you're going to put all of these things on your resume with all the numbers in time rather than trying to backtrack and figure it out. The next thing is making sure that you leverage these strengths and showcase these skills. So if you are talking about the corporate workplace, right, I love thinking about the ROI concept, return on investment. And so if you're really good at something, even if you invest a little bit, your return is going to be huge. And so you want to showcase this at work. You want to have those five things ready to go. And so when you're introducing yourself, when you are thinking about certain projects that you're going to take on, make sure that they're in your zone of genius, that they are really giving you that opportunity to shine through and let everybody see who you are because you're so good at it. Now, for the things that you are maybe not as good at, and I'll be honest, for me, that's copywriting and marketing. Those are definitely things that are not my strong suit. I like to delegate, right? And so you might be delegating to somebody on your team or you might be hiring some support. And we're gonna talk about support later on as well. The last thing is even if you're really, really good at something, don't neglect that skill set. Keep honing it and developing it, right? Put out thought leadership, subscribe to magazines, articles, whether they're online, participate in forums and make sure that you're building up on those capabilities so that they're polished up and they are up to date. Step four, I think this is another one that people sometimes feel a little bit awkward about, but especially in the corporate workplace, and actually even if you have your own business, self-promotion is key. If you can master how to talk about yourself in a way that is inviting to people, it's going to benefit you so much. And a point that I want to make here is that self-promotion, it's not about bragging or showing off, right? This is actually helping people connect with you because people and others often, they can't read your mind. They don't know what your strengths are or maybe what you've accomplished this year. And we assume that that's what's going on. But if you think about leaders, they are so busy and they have a full plate that they often don't know what all of the people that are reporting into them are necessarily doing or responsible for or what they've achieved. And so when you self-promote, it is talking about yourself in a highly effective way and it's highlighting your value and your accomplishments so that other people understand exactly who you are, right? And I want to tell you, don't wait. Don't wait till your six-month review or your yearly performance evaluation to talk about your accomplishments. A really good time to do this is when you are meeting with your manager one-on-one, -on -one, discuss monthly or even quarterly everything that you've done to date so that they're up to date with that. 
if you meet somebody new within your company, you also want to introduce yourself and talk about all of the accomplishments that you've had. So I led so and so, I've created $5 million of revenue for this department. You want to be very clear so that people know exactly what your personal brand is and what you're known for. Now, if you're working remotely, and a lot of us are, there's a few additional things that you can do to self-promote and really be visible, right? So one is having regular connects with your team. Sometimes it feels like, okay, we're meeting too much and you want to overlook this, but it's so important to maintain that human connection. And you can actually either set up formal meetings where you're meeting with people online or in person, or you can be sure to use the chat function, right? And so maybe your company is using Teams or Slack. Make sure that you're checking in with people. How are you doing? What's going on? So that they remember you, so that you are actually building authentic connections. The next thing is if there's opportunities to participate in certain projects, so you've got your portfolio of things that you're responsible for, but there might be a world culture day, or there might be an opportunity to present to leadership, something that's outside of your usual scope of responsibilities. I would encourage you to participate in those high visibility projects, right? Find out, work with your leadership, your managers, your peers, find out what those things are and make sure that you're seen in those organization-wide projects and themes. Last is communicating frequently and letting your accomplishments be known. So I know we talked about this in the self-promotion, but again, this is really especially important if you're going to be remote because you don't have as much face-to-face -face interaction. The last thing is think about things that are going to be outside of the office meeting a coworker for coffee or even meeting your manager and taking the initiative to do that. And maybe you even want to set up happy hours for your whole team or suggest a team building event. Team building events are known to be very strong human connectors, and it is going to help you be seen and be visible and really get your accomplishments out there. This is also, I think, a very, very important step is getting support. And this can be the most difficult because oftentimes we want to do everything ourselves, right? If we're a high performer and we're motivated and we're advancing our careers, we think we need to do it all. And I would say to you that you cannot advance your career in a silo. You need other people's support, whether that is champions within your own organizations, whether that is a, a mentor, whether that's leaning on friends and family to help you manage things in your personal life. It's so important, first of all, to get in the mindset of getting support. And this plays into my earlier points of focusing on what you're good at. Instead of spreading yourself thin and being good at 20 different things, 100 different things, focus on those high value tasks, right? Less on the administrative piece and think about what you can outsource. So this sounds very simple, but I'd love to share a little story here with you about a client of mine that was a CEO and she had some really big career goals. She wanted to um, get onto a nonprofit board. She wanted to publish her own book, and she also wanted to put out a TED Talk. And she's doing this while being a CEO, while managing a family, and she was cooking dinner every night. And so we did a really simple exercise to find out where her time was actually going versus what she thought. And she was spending so much time on the dinner preparation, buying the ingredients, washing, cleaning, setting up dinner, all of this. And one tweak of outsourcing that dinner, she uh, enlisted a meal delivery service. Just that one simple tweak saved her about 10 hours a week and helped her just free up mentally so that she could focus on getting her TED Talk done, getting on a board and publishing her book. So with that change within six months, actually, she was able to hit all of her goals. So my point here is that 
you know, don't feel like it is a bad thing to get support. It doesn't mean anything about you. And in fact, if you truly are getting into that CEO mindset, you need to get support from others in your life. Uh, one additional point I want to make here before we move on is about champions. So I spoke earlier about mentors and champions. And if you are looking to get promoted and move up very rapidly within your company, identify a champion who is actually going to help promote you, right? So this is somebody who has a huge impact on your career and who has the authority and um, who has a leadership within your firm or organization to help drive you forward, right? So this is not just a mentor who you're meeting with, who's providing really good sound advice, but this is somebody who, when it's time for promotions, when performance reviews are going on, they are going to speak up for you and they're gonna support you to help you move forward. Okay. So the most important point is focusing on your biggest asset, which is you. You have made it this far with this, you know, beautiful personality of yours, with your magical brain, with all of the skill sets, everything that you have. And sometimes we forget that, right? And we're so focused on getting that end result, moving our career forward, that we start to neglect ourselves. Right. And we're putting in more hours and we think, OK, if I'm going to work more hours, somebody is going to see this. They're going to promote me. But actually, statistically, it's been proven that those who work more hours after a certain level in their career, they're not seen as leaders. They're actually seen as doers. And so if you are trying to get promoted and this is why having that clarity in your career strategy is important. If promotion is important to you, it is so important to brand yourself as somebody who can delegate effectively and can manage everything on their plate, right? And that is not about being available all the time, being available after hours, being open on the weekend, saying yes to everything. So I really want you to keep that in mind. And so how do we get back to focusing on ourselves? So this is a little bit about making sure that your cup is full. When you start that day, you want to be energized. And so many of us, we have this tendency that as soon as we wake up, we hop out of bed. What's the first thing we do? We either log into our laptops or we're going to take a look at our cell phone. And that is not the way to start getting energized because immediately your brain is in a panic. And we are not setting ourselves up for success. So maybe this sounds a little bit silly to some of you. Maybe it feels like, you know, how am I going to do this? And my challenge to you is take five minutes. Just take five extra minutes today while you're sipping your coffee or tea to just take a breath. Journal out what is your objective for today? What do you want to get done making sure that you are scheduling time to eat. So many of us, we're just fueling ourselves on coffee and then we're expecting to have these promotions and go farther, but we're so tired. So make sure that you're eating well. And also take a good look at your calendar and your schedule. So I like to have a weekly practice here where every Sunday evening, I review my calendar and I really check in with myself and say, is what I have on my calendar, does that match my priorities? And does that match where I'm trying to go with my life? Does this match what my goals are? Or do I have a lot of things? Am I telling myself that fitness is important and I only have 30 minutes with my personal trainer scheduled, right? So you have to take a really good hard look at your calendaring, at your scheduling, and when I'm talking about calendaring, I know that a lot of us do this. We only have work meetings. There's no time set up for actual work. There is no time set up for things that are fun, social events, and every single thing needs to be on your calendar. Eating lunch needs to be on your calendar, 
right? Time blocks for when you're actually getting things done and not talking to anybody. So like focus time, that needs to be on your calendar. Any things that are a priority to you, if you want to spend time with your kids more, everything needs to be on that calendar. It should not just be about work meetings. And that's going to help you so much because otherwise we think to ourselves, hey, this meeting got canceled. There's a free block here. And what do I do with this? Where instead I could say, hey, I was going to take this walk at 1 p.m. And now I can do that and I can set up some focus time for myself. Right. So you want to make sure everything is on your calendar and not on your to do list. The last thing is renewing your sense of engagement with your career. So the second part of this webinar is making sure that you're advancing, but without that burnout. Right. And it's been proven that if you feel engaged and you feel really good about your purpose and your why within your career, it is going to help you avoid burnout, right? It's gonna make things, first of all, very enjoyable for you because you actually like what you're doing and you are connecting with that purpose and thinking about why did I decide to do this in the first place? Because we all know when you have those really tough days and maybe something's going wrong with a client or the presentation didn't turn out as you wanted it to, you start doubting yourself and a lot of that creates exhaustion, right? And that tiredness and that lack of confidence. And so it's so important to make sure that you're always checking in with yourself in terms of how do you feel more connected to what you're doing? Because we're all spending so much time, so much effort within our careers that it should be something that you feel really good about. And it should not be the thing that you're dreading every Sunday night. So now coming to burnout, right? Um, what are the symptoms of this? What does burnout look like? Because I think this is becoming something that we're talking about a lot, but here's the things that I see the most from my clients and peers and other people that I talk to is the first thing is that overwhelm where your schedule is basically managing you. You're not managing your schedule. Your calendar has taken you over and you just have that sense of dread and it doesn't feel great. The next thing is that disconnection. So we talked about just a few minutes ago how connection and being connected to your why is so important. When we start feeling disconnected, we're just not feeling like this is it for us. We're thinking, I don't want to be here. That's another symptom of burnout. We can start getting resentful towards our children, sometimes our parents, friends. We start thinking, hey, you're a distraction. I need, I need to get this presentation done. You know I'm, I'm working. All of those things, those kinds of phrases start coming up and we feel that deep-rooted resentment because we've got so much on our plate and we're tired that any other request or even if somebody wants to do something nice for us, it doesn't feel great. We can also feel a lack of purpose. So this is something that I hear a lot. In order for us to truly be effective and to truly keep moving forward, it's so important for human beings to have that purpose and why. And sometimes we're just going through the motions, right? Think about your day. You're just on autopilot, there's no real purpose. You're sort of just thinking to yourself, I need to get the bills paid, but this is not something that you really want to be doing. And you just don't feel like you're making a difference, like what you do matters or that it's important, which is such a terrible feeling to have. The last is not being able to express emotions. You just turn into somebody that is very monotone, Somebody that, you know, if somebody says something and it's funny, you can't react, you're not able to cry, sometimes you're not even able to get upset, and you've just really shut all of those emotions off. And of course, this is a dealing mechanism that we have. The last thing is, you know, effects on our sleep, not able to sleep till late. Maybe you're waking up in the middle of the night, you're only getting a few hours of sleep. 
And for some of us, it might be having too many glasses of wine or just eating a lot. Maybe you're eating more than you did or ordering takeout and those comfort foods. And so these are all signs that I want you to be aware of. Now, a question to the audience is how many of you have experienced burnout in the last six months? And you're gonna answer this just yes or no in the Q&A. We'd love to hear. So as you're answering that, something I wanna share with you is that according to polls, 77% of employees are saying that they're experiencing burnout in their current jobs. But only 20% of workers are saying that, unfortunately, their organizations don't offer a program to help with that, right? And so that means that we have to sort of work through this on our own and equip ourselves with what to do. So we need to understand, first of all, why is this happening? Why do we get to this stage? So overpacked schedules. Right? There's just too many things that we've taken on personally, professionally, that are draining our time. And this is often a result of us saying yes. We've said yes to too many things when maybe we mean no. And sometimes overpacking our schedule is also about proving ourselves and proving our worth in the workplace or proving ourselves as a business owner is saying, I can do it. So I'm going to just pack everything in there. And that's not sustainable, of course. You can only maybe do that for a short period of time. The next thing is that we're not building in time for fun. We have all of these things. It's about chores. It's about all the shoulds. It is about work meetings. And we're not doing anything that is fun, like maybe simply taking a walk outside. By it, Maybe it's eating the thing that we really like or having a really you know, nice chat or conversation with somebody that we love, right? So we're just not making time for things that are energizing and feeling good. Burnout can also happen if you realize that maybe your career is not aligned with your values and it doesn't really match who you are anymore, right? Maybe at the time that you you took on this role, you had certain goals, but now you're you're realizing, hey, there is a misalignment here right? This is not true to who I am. And this is not really bringing me the joy that it used to. And I have some different aspirations. Next is not taking breaks. I hear this so many times from people where they're, it's so tempting, right? It's so tempting to keep sitting at your desk and churning out work. Maybe you're eating lunch at your desk and dinner at your desk. Everything is happening and you're not taking a five, 10, 15 minute break to just get a breather, take a step back and just get some mental clarity. The last point is of course, just neglecting our well-being, right? If you're not eating well, you're not sleeping well, you're overworking and you're not putting yourself first, of course, you're going to be exhausted and burned out. I might just pause and ask, Kathy, did you quite if we have the uh, poll results? Yes, just over 50% of our respondents have said that they have experienced burnout at their job. Perfect. So what do we do about this, right? A lot of us are feeling this burnout. And to be honest with you, sometimes we don't even realize it. We might have the symptoms and we don't realize it, or we might be on the cusp of the actual burnout. But what do we do to overcome this? So I had mentioned this before, but having that morning routine, the morning time is a really good opportunity to set yourself up for the day. So this is something that I advise all of the people that I work with is to take 30 minutes. If you can in the morning, take 30 minutes to put yourself first before jumping into all of the things that you need to get done. The next is work email. 
So this is something that is a little bit controversial because people always think that email is urgent, right? Anything that is a notification that comes up on your phone or your computer, it has the appearance of being very urgent and very important. But the truth of the matter is that if you really want to be productive and efficient in your day, first of all, you need to have certain points in the day that you're checking your email, right? So set up a time that you're going to check your email, you know, maybe once at nine o'clock, then again at 11, make sure that you have a schedule for checking your email and definitely avoid checking work email after hours to disconnect. So a lot of people who are effective, I know that they actually have two phones. You might have a personal phone and you've got your work phone. So you know that if you're going out to dinner or you're at an event, you're only taking your personal phone and you know that work can wait till after to check those emails, especially if it's after hours or the weekend. The next is having an actual lunch break. So again, I think this is going to be very difficult for some of you to actually start implementing, but it's very, very important is putting in that lunch break on your calendar. And some of us have to start slow. Instead of scheduling a full hour, start with 20 minutes, go up to 30 minutes, and then you've got an hour. And something that I want you to think about in terms of mindset here is if you were the CEO of your company, what are the things you would be prioritizing? Would you be prioritizing yourself and would you be putting yourself first? And how important is everything on your calendar? So you want to treat yourself like you are the CEO of your life, right? And you want to put in those proper breaks because it's going to make you more efficient. And you want to stop thinking of breaks and eating meals and having these routines as things that take away from your time. And rather, they're actually going to end up creating more time in your schedule because if you're energized and you're thinking clearly and you have those boundaries, then you're able to get more things done in a shorter amount of time. And you're not maybe making some of those mistakes because you're feeling tired or having to relook at things, right? And I know we're all guilty of this. Next is about delegating. So making sure that you are working with your teams effectively and rather than make thinking about doing everything yourself, if you've hired these people who are experts, make sure that you're delegating to them and allowing them to do it, right? And maybe they're going to make a couple of mistakes or maybe it's going to be a little different than the way you would have done it, but it's going to save you that time and energy by delegating and making sure you're only focused on the tasks that are high priority and high value for you. And also including your family, making sure that you have everything set up in your personal life with family and friends so that it's supportive and you can delegate things that need to be done with them. This is a really nice one, which is combining your to-do list with socializing. So what I mean by this is maybe fitness is a priority for you, and you have said you're going to do three workouts a week. Invite your friends with you, right? Combine that. If you've got limited time and you want to see your friends and you still want to put yourself first, think about combining some of these times, inviting a friend out for a long walk because that's a priority, right? Maybe you wanna take this new yoga class or meditation class. Again, combine this with socializing to create more time. And this is where you can get really creative to bring that joy in and avoid burnout. Scheduling work time in your calendar. So again, we talked about this. We're laden with meetings all day, back-to-back -back meetings, because we have those blocks open sometimes in our calendar and then we're working after hours because we need we didn't get anything done throughout the day. We were stuck in meetings. And so this is a really good opportunity for you to actually put focus blocks in the calendar. Outsourcing tasks, we talked about this a little bit before, but make sure you hire somebody who can help you to do the things that are, you know, that you don't want to do or that you don't like doing or that you simply don't have time for that are not creating value. 
The next one is learning to say no and setting boundaries, which we're going to talk about more. So again, saying yes, when you say yes to something, remember that you're saying no to something else. It's a trade-off. So what are boundaries, right? Boundaries are the limits that we're communicating to others. And it's really about having clarity around what we're going to do and what we're not going to do. So usually most of us are really good at boundary setting, but maybe we're not good at maintaining the boundary. And you need both of these pieces to have that work-life balance and really to advance in your career. Because again, going back to that CEO, that CEO is not saying yes to doing everything themselves, right? They are outsourcing, they're delegating, they're managing their time well. And so I want you to think of yourself the same way. So what are some practical tips at work to maintain these boundaries? So the first one is going to be communicating openly with your leaders, right? And so you want to communicate those boundaries. You want to describe the impact. If you have schedules that are all filled with meetings, a lot of these meetings we don't need to be at. Maybe there are so many meetings that it's uh, you know, a biweekly meeting. Can you cut down on it? maybe the meetings are too long. So start thinking about those and describing the impact with your peers and your leadership of what it does to have exhaustive schedules. Last thing is establishing those clear working hours. So really set those hours of when you're going to be available and when you're not going to be available. And this one I talked about is questioning. Question if these meetings, if these tasks, whatever you're being asked of, don't just take it at face value and really question if they're important or needed. So the power of no. Um, can we advance to the next slides? So the power of no, this is really what it comes down to, right? So like I said before, when you say yes to something, what are you saying no to? And I want you to think about why it's so difficult. Honestly, for a lot of us, it comes down to conditioning. We have not been conditioned to say no. And a lot of us have been taught it's not polite. It's not nice. It doesn't make us look like a team player if we say no. But it is essential. This is a non-negotiable. You must learn to be able to say no powerfully because it allows you to stop over committing and spreading yourself too thin, right? And you are establishing, again, think about that leadership mindset. Leadership is not about your title. It's about who you're being. It establishes that you are in control of things. You know what's important to you and you're able to communicate it. So it is so important to say no. And you're also setting expectations because I know we've all been in these situations where we've said yes to something, we couldn't truly do it, and then we have to say no later on, right? Because it was too much or whatever that looked like. And so it's so important for you to say no, communicate that up front, and really establish your boundary. So the last piece is thinking about what to do next. Right. And maybe you've done all the things within your power at your current job in terms of avoiding burnout, your job or your career. Right. You've cut back on hours. You've set the boundaries. Maybe you've even talked with other departments about what's possible and you transferring. Um, consider taking a break or a leave of absence. You've done all of those things but you haven't found a solution, right? Or you're just not feeling aligned, you're still feeling burned out, what do you do? So first of all, I wanna say it's okay to leave. I know that you might feel like it's again, a bad thing. How is this gonna look on my resume? What are other people going to think? But if you've truly gone through all of the avenues, this is about empowering yourself to make the decision that is right for you in the long run, right? What's going to work best? What's going to help you live the life and design the life that you actually want? And so if you've done all of those things, it's okay to make that decision to leave. Now, before you do leave, 
I want you to consider some of these things because even if you're going to decide to quit, we want this to be well planned, right? And so first off, I want you to get to a place of feeling really empowered when you decide to leave. So this is not about feeling drained and thinking, hey, this is the last straw. I, I can't get along with my manager. This is not working out. And you're feeling those terrible feelings when you quit. I want you to come to a rational decision that you've thought about and you're saying, you know what? I think that there's something better on the other side of this and I wanna to move towards something really amazing. And that's why I'm going to take this leap of faith and move on. Next is having a plan. So you don't wanna just up and leave and say, okay, I'm gonna give my notice. I want you to have a plan and think about, is it 30 days out, two weeks out? And this isn't just about what's normal in terms of giving notice, but you wanna do some financial planning. You wanna think about, okay, what are the benefits that you have? When will, your, um, will you be paid out for your paid time off? right? You want to think about maybe you've got a 401k that needs to be vested or some other benefits. So I want you to think about all of those things in your plan and account for it. And you also, of course, want to think about financial security because there's going to be an impact if you decide to leave, which again, can be a great decision. But what does that mean for you financially? Have you, have you taken a look at your savings? What is the next plan that you have? Do you have a mortgage that you need to worry about? And so these are all of the things that you just want to think about before you pull the trigger and you send that email out saying, hey, it's time for me to leave, right? And something else that's not on here that I would say is before you leave, also make sure that you know you have all the things prepared that we talked about. So you've got your list of accomplishments ready. You've got everything that you've done in that career job. You've got all those records so that again, when you leave, you are set up for success for that next stage in your career. Thank you, Perica. I'm just going to chime in here that um, you know we and any financial advisor. Uh, you know, your, your finances are not the totality of making a decision. It's just one of the segments, as Perica mentioned at the beginning, it's, you know, what are your life objectives? What, what gets you going in the morning? What are your values? But um, your finances are part of it. And we always believe in, you know, helping individuals to frame the decisions. So there's a lot of aspects to deciding, you know, if you're staying in a job, if you're retiring, if you're buying a house and um, knowing how, one decision affects the, the other. So this has been a great overview. Um, and I just want to open it up to see if there are any questions. Um, we yeah, do maybe. have our first question. Um, if you're just starting out in your career and you're unhappy, is there a minimum amount of time you need to stay at your job before you switch? That is such a great question. And I would say, you know, look, everybody's a little bit different, but I like to recommend that you hang in there for a year, right? If you can try to make it at least to a year, because look, I think everything is a learning opportunity. And unless you're like in a very like unsafe environment or something like that, make sure that you stay the year so that you can sort of figure out what are the things that you like and what you don't like so that when you decide on your next career move, you have more information and more data points to go ahead and do that. And I would agree with that as an employer that when I'm ever looking at resumes coming in, one of the first things I look at is how frequently somebody has moved because from an employer perspective, it takes time to train somebody. So you want somebody where there's a chance of them sticking around. Absolutely. That, that said, I will share a story that at the very beginning of my career, uh, when I was finishing up my MBA, thankfully I did an internship in corporate finance. Um, and, and I'm so, for, for the rest of my life, I will be thankful that somebody at work said to me, you need to look around at the people that you're working with and decide if you want to be those people 20 years from now. And I immediately decided I don't want to be this person. <laughs> and that's what brought me to, to personal finance. So that was one time where I made a quick switch because I just knew <laughs> this was not a good place to be. 
Any other questions, Kathy? Yep. How do you know if you are over promoting yourself? Is there a limit before people become annoyed, such as over posting on social media? Okay, so with over promoting, what I would say is if you're even questioning whether you're over promoting, that probably means that you're pretty self aware. And it's something that, you know, first of all, I don't think there is such a thing as over promotion, right? If we think about social media, for example, they say that the average person needs to see something 17 times before it actually clicks in, right? So I would just keep that number in mind that I don't think you are going to be over promoting yourself, especially if you're asking this question. Now in a corporate environment, I would be a little bit more careful because of course, every time you meet with your manager or your leadership, if you're stating the same points, of course, I think there's a time and a place that you wanna do that. And it should be very, very strategic. But on social media, I really would not worry about over promoting. I would think more about what is the point of what I'm posting? And is this providing value to the people that I'm interested in attracting to my audience? Okay, our last question. How do you identify a champion? And how do you distinguish, like what's the difference between a champion and a mentor? Sure. So a mentor actually could sit within your organization or outside of your organization. And they're really somebody who's there to advise you and coach you and help you develop your career, but they may not have any direct authority in terms of helping you get promoted or move up the ranks. Whereas a champion is somebody who is in a position of power and authority within your organization and is actually going to advocate for you and make sure that you are advancing. And it doesn't just have to be through advice, but they're actually speaking up in your favor in performance roundtables and saying, hi, X, Y, and Z has done all of these fabulous things. And I do think we should promote her. So that's the difference. Happy any other questions? <laughs> that is everything that we have. Okay, well, I want to extend a very warm thank you to Prerica for this great overview. And as I mentioned at the beginning, this is the first of a three series webinar on accumulating wealth. So I hope you'll be able to join us for the second and the third. The second is going to be talking about all the different aspects that really go into accumulating wealth, such as, you know, more unemployment, uh, housing, you know, making sure that your, your assets are protected, starting a family. Um, and really giving some greater insights there. And then the third of the series is going to be a little bit aligned with what we just talked about of if it's not a good fit, perhaps with where you are, perhaps you're thinking of branching out on your own and starting your own business or consulting career and uh, topics to consider as part of that decision. So again, a very uh, warm welcome to Prerica for uh, giving us a great overview and thank you to everyone uh, for attending with us today and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Take care.